before we begin, thank you very much to the end is never, 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 the end for joining the Patreon campaign. It probably goes longer than that, but that's as much as the email will actually fill in the subject title. So thank you very much. Uh, the end is never repeat ad nauseum for joining the Patreon campaign. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, apparently when it comes to these shout outs, the end is never the end. It just keeps going. And I thank every one of you for the support because it means I get to keep doing this for everybody. And that means the world to me. So, okay. So let's actually discuss unhinged episodes of Transformers. Now, now we're not going to discuss a whole bunch of them because there's a lot, but you know, we've known We've known them over the years, right? You know, so whether it's the low road, which is literally a 20 minute buildup to a fart joke, um, the episode in front of you, uh, which is web world where Galvatron goes to therapy or, you know, just about anything that happens in bot bots. You know, we have no shortage of just completely out of pocket episodes of Transformers. But there's one in particular I have to discuss because it's my absolute favorite to talk about. Now I was got I got to thinking about it today and was like, yeah, this was great. This was this was it was never better. And for that, ironically, we have to go to what I would call is possibly the most boring Transformers series of them all, Transformers Energon. And more specifically, we don't even have to go to Energon. We have to go a little bit further back to Superlink. Potentially an even more boring version of Energon. Uh, so, yeah, um, we've hit a point now where there's a lot of fans that have picked up on Transformers thanks to the movies, Transformers Prime, uh, Cyberverse even. Uh, and... There's a lot that have never gone back to watch these old episodes, and they've certainly never gone back to watch the Japanese versions. Some of you have, but most of you have not. So, well, it, for my generation of fan, this is a legendary episode. This was something everyone had, had to talk about when it happened. But for those who are newer fans, for those who haven't gone back to look at old media, here we go. Okay? Here we go. So... The plot of this revolves around a tournament. You know how most animes have tournament arcs and they take, you know, 40, 50 odd episodes. If you're Dragon Ball, it can take like 100. But tournament arcs are a staple of Japanese animation. You know, it's such a great way of showing off your character's fighting abilities, introducing new characters, uh, showing how imposing a potential big bad villain is. There's a lot to really get out of a tournament arc, but it's so long. It takes forever to get through the whole thing. Um, Transformers got through it in one 24-minute episode. Uh, and they got through one 24-minute episode of a, tr of a tournament arc with the magic of doing the fights off-screen. <laughs> Many of the fights in the episode are introduced you get to see what the matchup's going to be and then they immediately go we don't have much time so let's go to the next battle or in between like little cuts or little little visual gags the fight will just be over and the whole thing will have happened off screen uh in the one the fights that happen on screen they usually just end in one shot you know it's optimus going full assault the second he transforms uh, there, it, you know, it's a uh, shock blast delivering one big blast at a charging Autobot. It's very short stuff, you know, so they get through it pretty snappy, though. There's a lot of fights that just completely happen without any setup or anything. We just acknowledge that they happen. Oh, yes. And by the way, the entire thing is hosted by two cat girls. Two robotic cat girls that are either uh, horrifying or if you're like me and you've seen way too much anime, just kind of standard fare. If we're being completely honest, they're just kind of there. I just kind of acknowledge them. They exist. I I am so I am so like sensory dead on cat girls. These two do not bother me in any way, shape, or form. They're just announcer characters. So 
we have to talk about the Superlink version of this series, of this episode, because the American version tried to play this episode as straight-faced as they could, which is such a wrong choice. Aside from how many continuity gaffes it left, it, it, it left into the show, it also took away so many of the good jokes. It took away so much of this. So... Just to get the right context, we have to go to the Japanese version. So, like, right off the gate, literally the first line of the episode is a gag. So, remember, this was Transformers around 2004? Somewhere around, somewhere around about there? Uh, keep in mind, the Porygon incident from the Pokemon anime was still just a few years old. That was still a very fresh wound. So, a lot of animes, especially, like, TV animes for kids... They actually had little bumpers like this before the episode began that warned you to not sit too close to the TV and to make sure the room was brightly lit. You know, a lot of shows played it carefully like that back then. And Transformers was very much the same. Optimus Prime, or Grand Convoy, would come through at the beginning of every episode and warn these kids. The episode here starts with Galvatron doing it. The only time the bad guy gets to deliver the warning message. Keeping in mind, Optimus already delivered the warning message, so he's actually being very redundant. And the lights happen to come on as soon as he said it. So, it's stuff like that. Uh, it's very self-aware. And I'll show you some of the more self-aware gags in the episode later on. Uh, so, the stars of the episode are Rodimus and Hotshot. And this is a rare time, because Rodimus at this point... He's a team player, but he's still kind of antisocial. He's taking Hotshot under his wing. But the two are just like buddy-buddy super friendly here, which is a little bit off for Rodimus in this series. So already, things are a little weird. Things are already a little weird. It gets weirder when you meet their opponents in the first round, which consists of Mirage and Tidal Wave. And yes, I'm going to have to use the American names for all of these until I don't feel like it, uh, because uh, I want everyone to be able to keep up. You know, if I announce these two as Shockwave and Shock Fleet, uh, you know, and th then there's, of course, I kind of start forgetting some of the names of the, of the Superlink versions. So we're going to keep to the American ones just so everyone can follow along, no problem. But yeah, these are the same character. And the episode delighted in doing things like this, showing characters in both of their bodies at the exact same time, or showing characters who shared an animation model. So here's Inferno and Roadblock standing side by side. Now, of course, they're the exact same character, just retooled. So this is, again, a weird sight. It's a fun sight, to be sure, but it's just a little bit odd. It's a little bit off. And they did it again with Six Shot and Shock Blast. Uh, now, these two were actually completely individual characters. They're brothers in Energon and Superlink. So, these two could have absolutely coexisted, but by this time, Shock Blast was pretty well dead. Uh, they never got to have any screen time. And this episode delighted in showing us things that had never been done in Superlink prior to this or after this. Um, things like this. Um showing uh, Alpha Quintesson coming back, uh, who was also very dead at the time of this episode. So we actually got to see Alpha Quintesson for a bit. Uh, the multiple heads of Alpha are actually doing the narrating, and they actually explain what is going on here. They're in a simulator program that is designed to be kind of like a training system, but why some of the characters are actually there and others are computer simulation, they don't know. Why are some of the real Decepticons in the simulation along with the Autobots if this is an Autobot simulation? They don't know. Why is it a tournament format? They don't know. They, like, they try to explain it. They try to they explain what's going on. But the second they get questioned on the premise, the answer is just like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have an answer. So again, they're they're very self-referential. They're they're very uh they're, they're very aware of what they're doing. They're very self-aware. I told you they're self-aware. Here's how self-aware. Uh, Optimus Prime is the butt of a lot of the jokes and the running gags in this episode. So they do kind of play off of just like how overpowered he is once he combines. As you see here, 
we have a very comedic defeat of the two Decepticon combiners. Uh, this happened immediately after he showed up as uh, Omega Prime already. So, this was fun. This was fun. So, aside from this, there's a bunch of running gags throughout the episode that kind of involve Optimus Prime. One of them involves Wing Saber. Because every time Wing Saber showed up, he was always super eager to combine with Optimus Prime right away. Because that was the gag that, you know, throughout this, really throughout the entirety of the Unicron trilogy, Optimus Prime is so eager to go into super mode or combine with somebody that they were, they were literally like playing that as a gag uh, with Wing Saber as, as the brunt of it. Another running gag with Optimus Prime is the fact that because he has so many different combination modes, he always announces a different name. You know, in, in the Japanese version, it's Grand Convoy, Wing Convoy when he's combined with Wing Saber, and then Omega Convoy when he's combined with uh, Omega Supreme. And on top of this, you were either calling him Grand Convoy or you're calling him Commander Convoy, Commander Grand Convoy, etc. So the gag is that Everyone keeps cutting him off with names from his other forms that he doesn't want to be called at the time. And it he just gets exacerbated by it. He's, he's just like, Ugh. And, and it's it's funny. The dialogue cuts out, the music cuts out, and it's just like, Ugh. So they played to that gag. They also joked about his over-the-top transformation sequences, his over-the-top stock footage when it comes to combining, because once he combined, once he got to the final match uh, against Rodimus and Hotshot, he transformed in such an epic way that he was forced to land outside the ring and immediately lost the finals. Which is a really funny thing when you see him go through the epic transformation sequence, like he's really going to battle his, you know, like two of his like, like main soldiers, like you go like super serious with them. And then he just lands on the top of the Coliseum and then immediately the announcers go, we have winners and there's cheers and confetti and like, yeah, you landed outside the ring. <laughs> in the, in the American version, Convoy and the uh, American version Optimus Prime plays this as like, you didn't tell me about any stupid rules. In the Japanese version, he's just kind of left in stunned silence, which I think is way funnier. I think it's... It, okay, so they played to things like that. But actually, in the midst of this scene, we also got to see something we never saw in the series before, which was the head unit of Omega Supreme in robot mode actually acting autonomously and not just being part of the stock transformation sequence. So, a little bit that you didn't see before. Other things that you didn't see before in this episode? The combiner leaders in their individual robot modes. They're there. They're fully detailed. They're fully rigged. They could have clearly been animated at any time. But for whatever reason, it was only in this episode did we actually get to see them. You know what else we saw in this episode? Full anime combining sequences. The only time we saw them combine in Energon throughout the series, like throughout like actual uh, footage of the series, they're always in vehicle mode when it happened, and they always kind of turned into like, they always just kind of turned into energy combined, and then you know like merged into one big ball of energy, and then boom, there's your combiner. Super cheap, super bad. Everyone was disappointed by that. This was the kind of stock footage transformation we were expecting, and it's epic. It's some of the best animation in all of Energon, period. And I really wish we had more of it. So, super cool to see. I'm glad that they threw in some budget to this. Among the other things you saw for the very first time, uh, Rodimus in leg mode. Remember, in the Japanese version, he's Rodimus Convoy. His rank is equal to Optimus Prime, so he never served as the legs of a combiner. It was usually it was either it was usually uh, Prowl or or Hotshot that had to form the legs. This is the one time he was actually willing to transform into the lower half. On such a subject, though, it was the very first time we got to see Prowl as the torso, and the only time in the entire series we got to see it. 
which is upsetting because I think toy wise, ironically, he's probably the best torso in the entire line because he's not too kibbly, like he handles his bulk well, and his articulation is actually really, really good. So he finally gets to be the top half of the combiner, except uh, Downshift also wanted to be the top half of the combiner. So for the first time, we got to see what happens when two characters try to form the same half of the torso. So okay, good, good gag. Good gag, right? It plays to the universe. It kind of plays up like the jokes we did with the toys. It's a really good gag. It's a really good one to throw in. This also get, gives Snowcat and Demolisher an idea. They try to power link themselves. And to the animator's credit, they actually did a really good job doing a full like stock animation sequence of the super link for them. The way that they transform to be a torso and set of legs actually does feel like it could have worked. It did turn out like this. But for a second there, you believed. For a second there, you actually believed. It was hilarious, though. And this led to one of the most famous visuals from Superlink that everyone spread around. And it was this eye catch of them actually doing the fusion dance from Dragon Ball. Because that's what any anyone in pop culture Japan thinks of when they think of two characters combining. Uh, and appropriately so. I would say most weebs here in America and other places of the world would think the same. It's just a great little gag. It's a great little gag. There, by the way, there's a ton of eye catches. So eye catches aren't a thing anymore in animation. Uh, for Saturday morning cartoons, it was a big thing. Transformers had them back in the day. Uh, the most famous one is... Who's that Pokemon? Because the whole idea of an eye catch is to remind kids watching that the show isn't over because we went to commercial. Just stick around. We'll be right back. Right? Well, this episode, you know, there's always eye catches in the Transformers animes. Um, they had one, you know, they, oh, they always had different ones. They rotated what characters actually appeared for the eye catches. This was the chance for anyone to appear who hadn't appeared in a long time or to do some goofy thing once they do appear. So there's a lot there's a lot going on on the eye catch jokes, too. And there's like a dozen. They don't go to commercial a dozen times. They just randomly throw in eye catches. So like the first fight of the tournament, they announce the matchup Rodimus and Hotshot versus uh, Shockwave, you know, Shockwave or no, no, no. There I go again. Uh, Tidal Wave and Mirage. They do an eye catch, and then they immediately cu cut to the end of the fight. You know, things like this. This is the only, re <laughs> it's the only way Bulkhead appeared. But yeah, they immediately cut to the end of the fight, where Tidal Wave breaks the fourth wall. There's a lot of fourth wall breaking in this episode, too. And even after Hotshot and Rodimus actually defeat Optimus Prime, uh, there is still one more fight. They actually get to fight a special guest. That special guest is Unicron. Except he's super tiny. It is at what would have been at the time about a Voyager scale Unicron. Um, who actually gets to fight. Unicron also long dead by the time this episode happened. And Unicron gets a stock transformation sequence. And actually fights like an actual transformer. Uh, and it and the fight cuts off. Uh, before we see the conclusion, uh, the very end, we actually do see them like kickers watching the screen as all this unfolds. He has some of the transformers kind of down on beds or kind of in the VR simulation. And he gives the whole, uh, he gives the whole wrap up to the entire episode. What's the point? Was there a point to doing this? So the point to doing this was that it was the 500th animated episode of Transformers, and they were doing a big celebration by having a nonsensical episode. They had to cook numbers in order to get to that point. To get to that point, you have to ignore the OVAs like Zone and uh, Scramble City. You have to ignore Beast Machines, which had never aired in Japan at the time. But you have to include the clip shows that they did throughout Transformers all the way back to Generation 1. So yeah, they had to cook the numbers a lot, but I feel like it was to make sure that that episode 500 fell right in a good spot so that Energon slash Superlink could get away with a lot of this craziness. 
And good on them because, yeah, this is the kind of stuff that I wish Transformers could get away with more often. It's an absolutely insane experience, especially if you watch Superlink to this point and you get all the jokes that are going on and you just kind of delight in seeing these random combinations that weren't possible before. So, yeah, for my money, that is the most unhinged episode in Transformers history. An episode that didn't care about plot, didn't care about characters, didn't care about development. It was just silliness and fan service and playing with tropes, playing with expectations, playing with their own self-awareness. And it's glorious. It's ironic. It feels like the entirety of personality that Energon could have had as a cartoon was condensed down into one episode. And that's on the super link side of things, because once they had all that personality in this episode, the translators and director for Energon just kind of like sat there, took it and went, oh, we don't need this personality. This is getting in the way. But you know what? You can find this on YouTube. It's actually pretty easy to find if you search for Superlink Special. Go give it a watch. It's insane. It's absolute. It's hilarious. I wish Transformers would do it more often. So there's your trip down memory lane for the day. Thank you, everyone, for watching. And I hope I'll see you next time. I'm like, I think you guys got this. I will back away and I will see you all later. You've got this handled. <laughs> and Luffy's like, really? You're not gonna help me? Like, it's fine now. It's like these disgusting <laughs> creatures breathing down my neck and you're all just like, I believe in you. You got this. That all right, you seem to have this. Five minutes. <laughs> <laughs>